Okay, guys, we are in chapter five. I think this is my favorite chapter of the year just because everything flows together so nicely. It's so systematic. Um, as long as you can stay organized with, there's like four different things, you'll be fine. So this whole chapter is on the cell membrane. I don't care what you are. You wanna be a prokaryote, be a prokaryote. You got a cell membrane. You wanna be a eukaryote, yeah, you, you got it too. Whether you're a fungi, a plant, an animal, I think if you're watching this, you're an animal, but everything has a cell membrane, okay? And that's that layer on the outside. So when we're talking about the cell membrane, I always like to start with something, you know, in each chapter, just to get you to understand the significance to it in your body. So this is all gonna be on cell transport. We're gonna be moving things into the cell, moving things out of the cell, okay? I always like to think of Cheerios, and I got a few weird examples for you here, but let's say hypothetically, you get a bowl of Cheerios in the morning, okay? Go downstairs, wherever, pour your bowl of Cheerios, put your milk in it, then you go back upstairs, you're brushing your teeth, washing your face, getting dressed, getting yourself ready to come to school, and then you go back, and you find those Cheerios, and it's like, oh my goodness, they are so mushy. What happened to those Cheerios? Well, what happened, obviously, the milk. The milk went in to the Cheerios, all right? And they become saturated with all this liquid, and now they're soggy, okay? Could you imagine if your cells did that? Or, you know, even a better example. I got a lovely baseball here. If you guys have ever found a baseball in water, any kind of ball that is able to take on water, okay? Golf balls aren't a very good example of that because golf balls aren't permeable to water. But if you get a baseball and you pull it out of the water and let's say it's been in there for an hour, okay, not a big deal. If it's been in there for a long time, if you, yeah, they're, they're like, it's like throwing a brick. You're not gonna throw it very far. Just like, you know, <laughs> this guy here, I, 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 don't, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, um, yeah, the, the water all went into the baseball. The baseball got heavy and could you imagine if that was our cells, all right? Our cells would be so heavy if they were able to take on all the water we drink that we'd weigh hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of pounds, you know, wouldn't be good. So we're also gonna talk about um, water moving out of our cells as well in this chapter. So here's some fruits, obviously. <laughs> yeah, they lost some water. So they are very um, shriveled up, okay? So that can happen too. And the lovely lights went out. Give me one second here, guys. All right, very sorry. So um, what we're gonna talk about in this chapter, guys, is things moving into the cell and things moving out of the cell. Here's a little animation of something moving. Well, if the bottom is down here is inside of the cell, it'd be something moving out of the cell, okay? All right, so if you remember how we got things out of the cell in last chapter, mostly we dealt with proteins. We're going to deal uh, with a bunch of things in this chapter. We're gonna deal with water, and water's really interesting on how it moves in and out of the cell, all right? So just to start off, guys, just a little review, whoops. Uh, our cell membrane, is made out of phospholipids. If you remember, that is one of our polymers of lipids, okay? We had two parts to our phospholipid. We had our head, which was a phosphate, and it was hydrophilic. And then we had our two fatty acid tails coming from each one. Those were hydrophobic. They could be saturated or unsaturated. Okay. Some uh, different cold water organisms, they like to have unsaturated fatty acid tails because they uh, help to maintain fluidity, maintain like a liquidy kind of portion of the cell membrane. Right. So there's your two parts of a phospholipid, there's your cell membrane. 
Um, what we do to make our cell membrane is we're gonna take two layers of our phospholipids, okay? We call it a bilayer, bi means two. So we got two layers of our phospholipids. Um, if we were to, I always think of this guy's nice cake, okay? That is like two layers of phospholipids that make up our cell membrane, all right? Why we have two layers, water can get up close and personal to our phosphates, whether it's outside of the cell or inside of the cell. Water can touch them. However, if we have a water molecule here, I'll draw our Mickey Mouse water molecules, sure, they can, they can touch our phospholipids, okay? But they cannot, they cannot pass through our cell membrane because this inner area right here, okay, is nonpolar. And if you remember, water is polar. So water cannot combine, water cannot pass through things that are nonpolar. All right, so we already talked about this, guys. Uh, phosphate groups are hydrophilic. They, they like water, all right? Um, so the area facing the outside and inside of the cell, they like water. The area inside of our cell membrane, in the middle of it, whoops, um, that area is hydrophobic. It repels water. It doesn't like when water is near it. Okay, so that's that area in the middle. This is why water cannot, as we just said, easily pass through the cell membrane. There's two different types of transport we're gonna go over. The first one is called passive transport, and we're gonna spend most of our time on passive transport. All that it means, if you are passive, okay, if you're a passive kind of person, you don't like confrontation, all that stuff, you're gonna uh, kind of shy away from it. What we mean passive in this sense is gonna be it does not require energy. So no energy is needed for passive transport. The opposite is gonna be active transport, Active is going to require energy, so we need energy for it to take place. So we're gonna begin with passive transport, guys. There are three different forms of passive transport. We're gonna go through all three of them. We're gonna start off with diffusion, okay? We're gonna then go to osmosis, and lastly, facilitated diffusion. So passive transport, <laughs> passive transport divided into three different categories, um, again, each one of these, diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, they do not require energy because they are passive. So let's begin with diffusion. So diffusion is going to be the movement of molecules, and I'm going to show you a bunch of examples with this, from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay? So what we say is diffusion moves down its concentration gradient. All right. Um, there's going to be a difference, usually, between our molecules on one side and the other side, all right? So we are going to move to where there is um, a lower amount, all right? Picture it right now, guys. I mean, my goodness, there's COVID out there. Um, when we're back in class, for those of you who are not remote, you know, I try to space you out the best I can. Is it perfect? No, not at all, because, you know, I got some classes that I have almost 30 kids in, so it's, it's impossible. Um, however, however, we try to space as much as we can, all right? If I put all of you guys in one corner of the classroom, you'd be like, hey, come, you know, there's, the, the Rona's out there. What are you doing? You know, I, I am not social distancing at all, okay? You guys would want to spread out and have an even amount of space between you and everyone else, okay? That means you're moving from high concentration to low concentration until we hit something called equilibrium. Okay. And then the last thing there, guys, the diffusion requires no energy. We already went over that one. Easiest form of diffusion I could think of, guys, put a drop of food coloring in a glass of water. All right. You could just let it chill there. It might take time, but you could just let it sit there and diffusion will occur over time. In other words, that one drop of food coloring over time will disperse throughout the whole um, beaker, and the beaker will be uniform in color. If you look at the beginning right here, with this purple, is very concentrated. It's a very deep purple right there. But as we go on, it starts to get a little lighter. And then lastly, it's pretty darn light compared to that first concentrated drop. So it's moving from an area of high concentration, right there, the deep purple, 
all the way to low concentration, which is the lighter color purple on the right side there. All right. Another example you guys can think of this, um, picture in class, okay? I know you're probably remote learners, so you know, you're not in class, but if you were, okay, pretend a student just, oh my goodness, they, they smell, poof, okay? I don't know what they ate for lunch, but their breath is kicking, right? So if that's the, the, the scenario, okay, maybe someone might be like, oh, I need, a, I need to get my bath and body spray out and poof, put a little spray, okay? Originally, if let's say, I don't know, uh, Kristen, we'll just say her name is, Kristen sprays this bath and body spray, one little spray of it, originally she smells it, okay? Over time, that spray, that one little spray is going to diffuse throughout the whole room so it is even throughout the whole room and everyone can smell it equally. They're not gonna smell it as, um, as greatly as Kristen smelled it originally when she sprayed it because it was in high concentration there, but they will smell it a little bit. Okay, so what we're gonna do for diffusion, we are moving the solute particles. Solute, you remember in a solution we have two parts. We have a solute and we have a solvent. The solvent is what does the dissolving, the solute is what is dissolved. So in diffusion we are moving the solute particles again from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay, and we already went over this example here with the bath and body stuff. All right, so we are going to continue diffusion. In other words, these solute particles are going to keep moving until we reach something called equilibrium. And what equilibrium is, is where we have the same concentration throughout everything. Okay, we have that same exact concentration uh, in our whole solution there, okay? All right, so here's an, another example, guys. Let me move myself again. I don't know, well, move me up there. There we go. So in this example, if you look at our cell membrane here in the middle, this is extracellular. That does not mean it's extracellular, like, you know, it's like supercellular. No, extracellular means outside of the cell. Um, here, outside of the cell originally, this is going to be our high symbol for concentration, high concentration right there. Down here, I know there's none, literally none, but that would be a low concentration. Over time, what's gonna happen is our solute particles are moving right through the phospholipids, okay, of the cell membrane. Now, in the end, if you notice, there's roughly about the same number on each side, okay? We might be off by one or two, but roughly it's the same amount. That is when the concentrations are equal. That is when equilibrium has been reached, okay? Um, for diffusion, we are going to be moving, again with this picture, in order for them to move right through the phospholipids, they have to be small and they have to be nonpolar molecules, things like oxygen, things like an element like chlorine or nitrogen, okay? If it is charged at all, if it has any charges on it, so if we have, like, if these were Na+, plus, that's what we mean by a charge, okay? If it has a plus or minus on it, they will not go through the cell membrane. They will go down and they will get rejected back. They won't be able to pass right through the phospholipids. But if we have something really small, uncharged, nonpolar, something like oxygen, yeah, they can pass right through and get to the other side with no problem. So that's what we mean by small, nonpolar. All right. All right, we're gonna skip that one. Um, here is what your cell membrane actually looks like, guys. Okay, so I drew a little picture on the board, took a picture of it, put it on here for you. But if we looked here, okay, we have our phospholipids. We have these green things are proteins, and then the blue things are actually carbohydrate tags. So the carbohydrate tags uh, are what are there in order to make sure that, hey, maybe, let me draw here, maybe this one right here only moves glucose. That carbohydrate tag right there, wow, that was a jacked up arrow. I apologize for that one, guys. That carbohydrate tag right there, I'm just gonna call it a carb tag, will say, hey, this protein right here 
only allows glucose to pass through. If you're anything other than glucose, get away. Okay? So that's what goes on there. Right. Uh, if we want to do a quick example. Let's say these are small nonpolar, something like nitrogen gas. Okay, what's gonna happen here? Our small nitrogen gas particles are gonna move right out through the cell membrane. A few of them will move out right through our phospholipids. We don't have to worry about the proteins until we reach equilibrium, okay? All right, so that is diffusion, guys. We will start on osmosis tomorrow. Have a good day.